A wise man once said, an eye for an eye would only make the whole world blind. But peace is always beautiful. That's why the National Peace Council exists in this country. With elections on the horizon here in Ghana, what are the plans of the National Peace Council to ensure a violent free election? In this edition of Hot Issues, we have a peaceful discussion with the chair of the National Peace Council on a wide range of issues. Join me and Reverend Dr. Enes Edujemfi, chairman of the National Peace Council, as we take a fine tooth comb through their mandate and other emerging issues of national concern. My name is Alfred Okansi, sitting in for your regular host, Kemeni Amano. Welcome, Reverend Dr. Enes Edujemfi. Thank you. Now, uh, for the benefit of Ghanaians who don't know the mandate of the National Peace Council. What exactly is your mandate? The object of the National Peace Council is to facilitate and develop mechanisms for conflict, conflict prevention, conflict management, and conflict resolution, and to build sustainable peace in Ghana. This is basically the mandate that we have been given as a council by the act that established the council. I see, but now we've seen you also talk about issues or the underlying currents that would lead to conflict, for instance. So you, you, you don't wait until a conflict occurs before you, you, you start speaking about it, isn't it? By our mandate, we are supposed to prevent conflict. Mm -hmm. And so whenever we see conflict potentials uh, or we have signals that indicate that these things are likely to lead into a conflict situation, the council takes interest in that and we do the best we can to intervene in such matters. And that includes, for instance, economic situations, of, obviously, that get people really either into poverty, as we've seen the, the, the various statistics over the period in this country as well, is it not? In terms of direct economics, we have not had uh, cases come to us. Mm -hmm. But currently, we are dealing with cases of land litigation, mm -hmm. chief tenancy conflict, resource conflict, uh, we are dealing with political and religious conflict, ethnic uh, issues, and there are others that we, we, we classified as others. And a total of 298 cases are currently on the table of the National Peace Council, which are being looked at. Only 24 of them are political. Only 24 of them are political. Right. I see. But we talk about chieftaincy, for instance, the Boko situation mm -hmm. as well. What has the National Peace Council been doing because we've seen over the period mm. at least recently this uh, conflict also claiming lives mm. and and questions have been asked as to what exactly some of these institutions like yours mm. have been doing over the period the national peace council has been involved in the boku issue for years mm. and uh, we had been part of the inter-ethnic inter travel uh, committee Mm -hmm. between the two the, uh, factions that are there and we have managed it for over the years until this last uh, conflict came up again and then some of the kusasis withdrew from the ethnic uh, committee fortunately we've been able to bring them back and so the committee is now actively working and we're doing everything we can to uh, see to the resolution of this we are also liaising with the uh, uh, otunfo uh, we, in fact, we have a meeting with him very soon. Uh, we're waiting for the date that he will be available. He was out of the country for a while and he came back. They had all these uh, festivities. Mm -hmm. And so we hope to be in touch with him to see how far his committee can also help us in, in, in resolving this problem. So the, the council hasn't given up on Boko yet. I see. But if you've been involved in this Boko situation for many years, as you indicated, why has your impact not been brought to bear? and getting a lasting solution to the Boko conflict? I think that uh, the council over the years has been the, the, the factor that has sustained the peace in that area. The council has yes. been the factor sustaining yes. the peace That's right. in Boko? In Boko. I mean the fragile peace? In, in the past, until this last uh, eruption of the conflict. So what were you doing? Uh, because of the Boko Interethnic uh, Committee, we were facilitating all those uh, negotiations and uh, discussions that kept the, this, uh, the, uh, the piece of the place until this last eruption. Mm -hmm. Currently, what we have is that the issue has escalated beyond a certain proportion. 
and there's before we can go in because we don't have the mandate to arrest we don't have a mandate to prosecute uh, when there is peace then we can get in but we've been in and out of the place we've met the Boko Naba, we've met the Nairi we've met the all kinds of people within the area we've met various groups and we are still actively in there uh, currently the uh, regional peace council is bringing together uh, some activities that seek to be bringing the youth together in the area. So we've not really given up. The challenge we have is the, the, uh, the criminal bit of the case, where uh, the banditry, the sh shooting of people indiscrim indiscriminately and all the other mm -hmm. things are coming in. But we cannot get in until those issues uh, subside. Uh, we can op operate even when people are ready to talk. And mm. until we get into that situation, it becomes difficult for us to get into that situation now. Have you had to confront some political interest in the process of your work in resolving this Boko conflict? We have spoken to various parties, uh, but would not directly say they are political interest, even though but we, some political we, we suspect that there must be something. But we will not be able to lay hands on that specifically. So we don't want to call it political. But we've been talking to all the interest, interested parties in this case. Uh, doing the best we can to make sure that uh, we bring the parties to the table because we believe that the killing will not end the problem. It is about talking and coming to a certain consensus uh, in resolving this problem. And are they ready to talk? Not, not at the moment, I'll say not fully. Uh, once we've been able to get the quizzes back to the committee, it's a positive sign. Mm. And we are still engaging and hoping that uh, some of the steps we are taking will yield uh, positive results. We've seen uh, the military's operations in there, which has also led to some excesses. And uh, is the council concerned about this? I didn't hear of you when these military excesses came up. You, National Peace Council, you were very silent. We, we weren't. Uh, what did you say? Yeah, we, we were, we are, nobody is happy with the killing of anybody. But one of the things that we also want to caution Guineans is that any time we talk about the military and the police, these are the institutions that are supposed to protect the lives and property of Guineans. Mm -hmm. And so we are very careful in terms of condemning them or bashing them. Because once they also become demoralized, it will be very difficult for us to deal with this problem. And so we keep talking with them. We've had meetings with the IGP. We had meetings with the CDS, the former CDS. There's another planned meeting with the current CDS, uh, which is coming on, I think, in the next two weeks. Uh, so we keep engaging them and hoping that some of these engagements yield positive results. Uh, in some other areas, apart from Boko, we have seen some positive results mm -hmm. in terms of our engagement. Th that's the more reason why if there are actions that are not general but specific, mm -hmm. isolated excesses of the military or the police, don't you think that it will be worth you, National Peace Council, openly speaking about it instead of saying, okay, you don't want to demoralize them so you'll be silent about it? No, you see, for us, uh, we don't respond to just what we hear in the news. We always want to be sure of the facts on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when certain things happen and people are calling on, why is the Peace Council not speaking? Until we've gotten in touch with our regional council, we have situational report, we have the facts on the ground. It is, we are very careful with what we see. And it's only when investigations are done and we are very sure of what the situation is, that is when we come in to make a statement. But your, your silence has been very deafening mm -hmm. on some of the issues of national concern, which was not the modus operandi of, of the National Peace Council in the recent past. So consistently in the recent past, at least between for instance, 2012 and 2016, we were very outspoken about economic challenges or that we were faced with as a country uh, you know, and so many others. Mm. So why are you silent now? Well, I think you, that you lost your voice. We haven't lost our voice. Uh, the council goes through uh, leadership changes and each leadership has and each board has its style of, of operation. In our current board, we came up with the idea that because we are mediators and negotiators for peace, once you step out to condemn one party, it becomes difficult to bring the other party to the table for negotiation. And therefore, we have been very cautious about condemning anybody. 
But when we meet with the parties, we draw them, we, we call them to our offices, we meet with them. Sometimes they apologize right there that, no, that was not what we meant, this is not what our intentions are. Mm -hmm. And we caution them that these things are not helpful. Instead of going out publicly to say we condemn this and we condemn that, condemnation alone does not solve the problem. But once we are able to bring them to the, the table for deeper discussion, we think that we are able to make a better breakthrough than just talking. Well, are you saying that the mode of operation of your predecessors were wrong? No. They, they, they decided to come out publicly, hold press conferences to state the position of the National Peace Council publicly on issues, for instance, on the economy. You have decided that you want to be silent and do backdoor mediation? Right. I think every leader has his style. So your style is to be silent? Well, uh, the style of the current board is not to be silent, but we have... We do uh, shuttle diplomacy. We meet with people. We talk to them. If you take the case of the political parties, for instance, mm -hmm. from last year, we've had quarterly meetings with all the political parties. We had the current one just last week. And we meet with them. We talk about issues. We put the issues on the floor. We dissect them. And we come to consensus. You know? So once we get into that space, we are able to deal with issues better than just screaming but you are the vanguard of the conscience of the people i mean the christian community and indeed largely um, everybody upholds peace mm. and ghana is also touted to be and rightly so the the most peaceful country at least in the sub-region so if we've seen over the period the peace council openly speaking about issues that affect the people why do you think that you not speaking publicly to let the people know that you feel how we are feeling? For instance, when the economic crisis was at the, at, at the crescendo and everybody else was talking, the National Peace Council was never heard. And so questions were, is it that the National Peace Council has been compromised? I think the most important thing is to look at the mandate of the council. Mm. Ours is to facilitate and develop mechanisms for conflict prevention, conflict resolution. But previously we saw right. the National Peace Council speak about issues beyond conflict. Right. So that's why we are staying within our mandate. And we want to be sure that we don't do anything that takes us out of our mandate. So your, your predecessor was speaking outside of the mandate of the Peace Council? Well, I have said earlier on that every leader has a style. You see, sometimes the, the extension that the public does not, is not able to make is the difference between a particular leader at a time as the chair of the council or a member of the council and his or her position in another sphere. For instance, I can speak elsewhere in, my, in the past as the president of the Ghana Baptist Convention. Mm -hmm on a particular issue. But when I come to the Peace Council, my tone may be totally different. Because in that, uh, in that first capacity, I'm speaking not as a reconciler, but I'm speaking my mind as another head of a religious institution. Sometimes we are not able to make that distinction. So because that individual is playing that dual role, for instance, if we take my immediate predecessor, who was the presiding bishop of the Methodist Church, mm -hmm. he may say something based on what the Methodist Church wants to put in the public domain. And then he comes back as the chair of the council. So it, people cannot separate these two, but sometimes it's important to distinguish between our capacity in the other space and the capacity in the space. But, but it is that position that your predecessor took that also then reflected on the position of the Peace Council. So you're saying that he held dual roles, mm -hmm. but then again, in the minds of the public, they did not distinguish him from the chair of the Methodist Church and on also heading the National Peace Council. Yes. When he speaks, he is seen as the personality right. leading the National Peace Council, is it not? And I think that this, this is the distinction that members of the public should be able to make. And sometimes when we speak, depending on the forum within which the person is speaking. For instance, if I, in my role as the president of the Ghana Baptist Council in the past, mm -hmm. if I speak, spoke at uh, an annual session and something like that, I could raise concerns based on my, the feelings of the, of the of Baptists across the country. But then when I come into this role, I'm here as a mediator, 
I'm here as a negotiator. And therefore, I'm careful with what I say in this particular role. But so, you know that the economic crisis could lead to a threat to the peace that we're experiencing as a country, isn't it? It is possible. So but did, there, you, did you say anything? It is not what we say about what the economy is doing, but what mitigating factors are we providing? When you saw pensioners picketing, for instance, for, for, for their monies, I mean, the Peace Council has a voice, is it not? No, the reality is that everybody has a right to, uh, what, what, what is the right word? To go on demonstration. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a right. And therefore, the fact that somebody is demonstrating doesn't mean there's a conflict. Mm -hmm. They are demonstrating because of their rights. Right. We mm -hmm. come in when we see a potential conflict situation. Is this going to erupt into something else? If people are demonstrating, the demonstration alone does not create a problem. The, what our concern is, you have a right to demonstrate, but ensure that you don't disrupt uh, public uh, safety, mm -hmm. you don't destroy things, you don't do all those things that could create animosity for those who are demonstrating. But the right to demonstrate, everybody has a right constitutionally to do that. But there are underlying currents that would lead to the eruption of a situation that you would now have to come and talk about. That's where the concern is. So you would rather want to speak before it gets to the point where you're thinking about resolution of a conflict. You see, for, for us as a council, when we see a potential conflict situation, we do the best we can to ensure that those mm -hmm. things don't erupt into what it ought to be, all right? Mm -hmm. But for some basic things that people are demonstrating about or concerns on radio and television, people have a right and freedom to speak their minds. So those are not issues of conflict. Uh, they are issues of expression. They may be different uh, views and opinion about certain issues, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's a conflict. The fact that we are sharing different opinions doesn't mean that there's a conflict. What's the National Peace Council's position on the anti-LGBTQ plus bill? People have, passed by Parliament. people have asked us and we've said that for us, we don't have a position. You don't have a position on no. the LGBTQ? As a council. No. Why? Because we are mediators. Assuming we take a position and somebody comes up and says, okay, what, there's a conflict situation here, what do you do? So the council itself hasn't got a position. But members of the council who belong to different institutions, our institutions have their position. But your position must I reflect... Belong the, the direct views and opinions of the Ghanaian people, is it not? Yes. For us as a body, we represent different uh, organizations. There are three uh, from the Islamic community, five from the Christian community, traditional worshippers are there, House of Chiefs represented. But do any of these representatives support LGBTQ activity? In this well, that's why I said that their institutions, all our institutions have spoken. Christian Council has spoken. So if Christian Council speaks, I'm a member of the Christian Council. All right. If the uh, Islamic community speaks, they are members of the Islamic com community. Mm -hmm. So the institutions we represent have made their voice. But as a council itself, we will not put our head up to say we support or we, we deny. Because we are there in case any conflict arises. We don't want parties to the conflict to think that we have taken a position already. Conflict in what form in this particular instance? LGBT group may want to erupt something, they may want to say something, somebody else may want to say something, something may come up that somebody thinks that, okay, what can the Peace Council mediate in this matter? Mm -hmm. So in some of these things, we allow things to, to flow. We don't plug ourselves into a situation that, for us now, it is not an issue of conflict. But Parliament has, has passed a law. Mm -hmm. If the president gives assent to it, it's a law of the country. And everybody must obey it. Yes. And, it, and to the extent that you have representatives of the people mm. passing or approving a bill, does it not also have to reflect the position of the council? Because you represent the Ghanaian people's interests, is it not? We do. We have never said yes or no to anything. We are just there. As I said, you know, we have set up a council with a certain mandate. Ours to ensure mm. that conflict situations don't erupt. So we don't take sites in terms of anything that... But do you think taking this neutral position is helping the council in any way? It does. In, in having an impact? Right. Because there are several issues that have come to us that mm. people expect that we as a council mm. should have taken a certain position. And then they come to us when we do start doing the mediation. Then they realize that, oh, okay, now we understand why you do things the way you do. 
for people outside, they had expected that once something happened, the council intervened, mm -hmm. we are saying that we condemn this, we do that, we do that. It, it, it hasn't helped us in our negotiation. As, as chair of the National Peace Council, what's your position on the anti LGBTQ plus? My law? position is what the Christian Council has taken. Which is? Which is against it. So you are against it? I'm a member of the council. You, you are against it? I said I'm a member of the council. And all your members <laughs> of the National Peace Council are against it? Not, I won't say everybody. And I can't, that's why Not I said that the council... On the National Peace Council is against it. That's what, LGBTQ I, what I've said is that the council itself has not taken a pussy. The Muslim communities, we have heard from all of them. All of them are against it. Okay. Christian communities, the Christian Council, the Pentecostal Council, the Catholic uh, uh, Bishops Conference, the Council of Charismatic, everybody has spoken. So, all the representatives have had their voice heard in different ways. Yes. But what I'm saying is that for us as a council, we will not take a position that Christian, the Peace Council is saying A or B. Because we are waiting to see how this whole thing unfolds. Assuming there's a conflict situation and we are called in, we will not be seen as being biased. I see. You're saying not all your council members are against the LGBTQ I've activities. not said that. I said that various members of the council, based on the position, the, uh, the institutions they represent, have made their positions clear. Do any of them support this? I've not heard any yet. Okay. This is Hot Issues. We are live here on TV3, also on TV3 Ghana on Facebook. We're back shortly after this quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back to Hot Issues on TV3. Reverend Dr. Enes Edujenfi is the chair of the National Peace Council, the former chair of the Christian Council of Ghana, was also a vice chair, and then also uh, the former president of the Ghana Baptist Convention. And he is our guest on Hot Issues. Mm -hmm. Bef before we went for that break, you were talking about some 24 political issues that you are dealing with. Mm -hmm. You are dealing with 298 cases in total. Mm -hmm. The political issues that, that you are dealing with, in, in what form or nature are they? Um, we've had uh, several issues within the regions where between the intra interparty uh, primaries and all of those things, some issues come up. And people sometimes will refer them to us and say, okay, can you intervene in these matters? Mm -hmm. And then we do the best we can to, to negotiate. In some of the issues, after a while, people just give up on them. And there, therefore, we can, we're able to move forward uh, with some of these. Mm -hmm. And um, that means calling the parties to the table? Yes, we do. I see. Mm -hmm. Now, I do know that there are some activities that you've been engaging in over the period, mm -hmm. I mean, ahead of election 2024. From your own monitoring, what are you postulating would be uh, the major issues going into election 2024? Well, there are several things that uh, we've put in place uh, in terms of our preparation towards the election. Uh, first, these things came out of a dialogue that was held in 2021. Mm -hmm. Immediately after the last election, um, with the support of the Commonwealth, we organized a forum in Ada that brought together all the major players in the political space. Mm -hmm. We had the police, the security services, the Ministry of National Security, Interior, um, the Electoral Commission, the political parties themselves, some CSOs, and uh, all the key players. All of us were there for four days to look at all the things that happened during the last election. What went wrong, what went right. Out of that, a roadmap was established. And then we're given a mandate to ensure that certain things were put in place before the next election. So for us as a Peace Council, the assignment that was given to us, we have pursued all of them up to date. Part of it was one, to meet with the Chief Justice to see if it is possible to shorten the adjudication process of the parliamentary elections. We've sent a petition to the Chief Justice. At our last but one forum, Justice Kolende spoke mm -hmm. to that effect. We are still pursuing them, hoping that uh, this will come to pass. In fact, we have another, meet, we have another meeting with the, uh, current, the, in, uh, the new Chief Justice, in, I think, in the next two weeks. And we'll be looking at this matter. The matter so, of reforms. The reforms in terms of the adjudication of the parliament. Currently, the mm -hmm. presidential one is supposed to be done within 42 days. Right. Parliamentary, I think as of now, we still have cases 
uh, from the last election mm -hmm. still pending. So we want to look at that. We've done that. We've had meetings with the, the IGP. We had meetings with the CDS. Now, in terms of the police, you will notice that the effect and the results we had between Ayawasu and then Asin North and Kumewu were mm -hmm. totally different. Yes. And part of it is the negotiation we've had with them to ensure that certain things were put in place to ensure that the police will get things done properly. We won't have any of those problems. And so in one of our dialogues in Pram Pram in the third quarter of last year, we brought the police and the political parties together to discuss all the issues between them, how the police view the political parties, how the political parties view the police. We had another encounter in Koforidia for two days where we brought the political parties, civilians, and all the security services together mm -hmm. so that they can hear from each other what the feeling of everyone is about mm -hmm. how we perceive the security service, how they perceive the public and all of that. At the end of all these things, very good conclusions came out. And that is why we are seeing that these last two by-elections didn't go, wasn't as bad as the previous ones. The extent that the, the security services are always seen or perceived to be uh, operating in favor of the government in power. Right. or the incumbent. You, it will surprise the, the you. The evidence has not been to the contrary, is it not? You will be surprised that the meeting with the, between the political parties and the police, mm -hmm. the police story is that they favor the opposition more than the current government. The police said they favor the opposition? Yeah, that is, that's what they're, 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 During elections? Not elections, all the things they do. Um, because why? They, if they become a little strong-handed, people feel that they are in bed with the government. That was what came out of the police. And we were all surprised. And all the parties were there. But the evidence suggests otherwise. So, so sometimes, you see, it's a certain perception. But we bring them but to the table. To it, That's it? right. We bring them to the table for them to talk. We are only facilitating. The parties are there. The police are there. Then they all exchange. These people are talking about what they see. They tell them what their perception is. And then we sit down and, and look at them. So at the end of the day, we are seeing some of these changes. And it's coming out of this Adan dialogue, which, which we had. The other thing was that because the NDC had pulled out of the IPAC, mm -hmm. they gave us a mandate to see if we could do something. And we were told at that meeting that IE used to have a forum for the parties mm -hmm. where they could meet once in a while to yeah. discuss certain things that had broken down. So could the NPC support that? We've done that. And the whole of last year, we met four times with the political parties. Uh, we talked about all kinds of things. This year, we've had the first one already, and we'll continue to do that. Now, all of these things are being done to ensure that the space is done uh, is, uh, is conducive for, for election. We've also introduced the uh, Vigilantism and Related Act Bill mm -hmm. and then the Code of Conduct for the Political Parties. So at our last meeting last week, we reviewed that to look at the conduct of the political parties in this space to ensure that while we're doing the campaigning and all of those things, we stay within the confines of the rules that we have set for ourselves. Mm -hmm. What was left for us to do was to set up a committee that will monitor these parties and what they do and what they say. So at the last meeting, that issue came up. The committee is being put together now. We we'll present the report back to them. If they accept, the people are rolled out to do the monitoring for us mm -hmm. to ensure that there will be safety. And uh, then we have also introduced the, uh, the guidelines on hate speech and interpret language. Also to guide not only the political part, but also the media space as to how people talk and what mm -hmm. are the things they can say and cannot say, and what defames people and all of those. So all these things have been put in place to ensure that we sanitize the system and make it uh, conducive for people to move around and do the things they have to do. But besides these things, mm -hmm. we also look at the general peace of the country. And so a lot of work has been done in terms of how do we sensitize the public. We've had training programs for GPRT, mm -hmm. To, for them to be able to see see something, say something. They are moving people around. What do they see? How do they right. see it? We've had training for maritime uh, fishermen and fisher folks. We've done one in Adan, one in Elmina. Mm -hmm. They go to the high seas. While we are protecting our northern borders, what do we do with the, with the southern borders? So we've done those things. We are training for tertiary institutions, student leaders. Uh, all the things that goes on in the schools, especially when schools are breaking, finally you see people destroying this and burning cars and all of those things. We've done that. We've gone to the secondary schools. Now we're going to some of the JSS mm -hmm. to ensure that we let people understand the issue of vigilantism and peace and why we need to live as peaceful people. So all these things have been done. We've trained 
uh, what we call the peace ambassadors, uh, 40 of them, to be in some communities. And some of the key areas like Ududududio, uh, Ashiaman, uh, Techiman South, and all the places where the killings were done, we've gone to all of those places to have training programs there, to hear from the people, to see what can be done to ensure that these things do not happen again. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these things have been done across the country. And we are still pursuing those things. For lack of funding, now we are getting some support. Yesterday we had a program for uh, the Netherlands Embassy. The mm -hmm. Calorie Services are coming to our aid to roll out some of the program. What we did for the police and the political parties, the civilians and the political parties, they themselves asked that they think that these are programs that we should duplicate across the other regions. I see. And so we are we're just getting some funding to, to start some of those. Already we've done five in the five northern, uh, some of the uh, regions in the north, making sure that we sensitize the people before the election. You know, it's one thing get, getting the commitment now, before election day. A lot happens on election day right. that we can describe as the trigger factors or the underlying currents that lead to some, some sort of disturbance. We all don't want that. But go back to the security that you, you, you mentioned. The role of the security in elections is crucial mm. in this country we've seen over the period. And questions have been raised about sometimes the conduct of the, of the, the various security agencies. You remember what happened in the Tichima North constituency. It's very fresh on our minds. What is the Peace Council's position on this? Because the families are still waiting for answers as to what happened to their loved ones, people who were killed as a result of an election. Right. I think when it comes to anybody dying in, or being maimed in any election, nobody in this country is happy about it. And that is why, for us, we've gone to those communities to deal with the issues that arose there. Uh, we know in some of the situations, there have been some compensa compensations paid to some people. And mm -hmm. part of it is that some of them are negotiation with... The Techiman North? Uh, Techiman, I'm not too sure. I can't, I can't put my finger on it. But uh, even at some of our meeting last week, it came up that mm -hmm. we know that some of the places, some compensations have been paid. So I need to check, check on that and, and be yes, very sure. because that plus Ayawaso, the yeah. Ayawaso West were gone. Right. The people are there. They're yeah. talking about no compensation right. paid to them. These are concerns that the National Peace Council must also concern itself, itself with, isn't it? Right. For us, what we can do is to appeal to the institutions that are responsible for some of these things. And as I said, we've had meetings with the Chief Justice. Uh, we talk about all kinds of things. Uh, we meet all the people who are involved. We've met with national security. We talk about it. And we expect that they will take it up. Apart from that, we, as I said, the mandate we have doesn't give us the power to command anybody to do anything. Certainly. Certainly. But, when you, when, but when you speak publicly or issue a statement, the Ghanaian people get to know what your position is. Right. I'm sure that will be some good for you, isn't it? Well, of late, we've come up with a few press releases on certain matters. Uh, because sometimes we notice that uh, in, in some of our engagements, when we have the media there, the reportage doesn't go the way we expect. Mm -hmm. So of late, we've been trying to release a few press releases just to clarify issues and state the position that, that, that we have taken. Is that um, not why you should be speaking publicly for yourself? Well. We, we've done the best we can. I think this program, for instance, is one of the media, medium that you've given us. And we do a lot of these things. Uh, we hope that a lot more will be done. Uh, we've strengthened our PR department. Now they are to, putting a lot more information on social media. We go to our website, there's a lot more information there. We're getting into TikTok and others, doing all of those things so that we can make ourselves as, as uh, relevant to the Ghanaian society as possible. Well, I get a feeling that you, you fear the, the public criticism and backlash. So you would rather, as a gentleman, as you look, take a, a diplomatic approach to dealing with matters instead of coming to speak publicly about, for instance, uh, the electoral commissions until recently, insistence on doing away with the indelible ink. You know, we were all in Koforidia when the electoral commission brought that issue. Mm -hmm. It came out at our forum. We organized that forum, mm -hmm. and that was when, where the NDC made a commitment to come back to IPAC. Mm -hmm. All of us were there. So when the EC said it, it was news to all, everybody. All of us were there. 
Did um, you speak about it? No, nobody did. The parties were there. The, all the top people... Uh, but but certainly these were issues that could also you know, bring some, some misunderstanding. Right. In, and that's uh, the concern of the Peace Council, isn't it? Right. In that forum, as I said, all of us were hearing it for the first time. We were not sure whether these things had been agreed at IPAC or whatever. Nobody said anything. Neither did we get any response. No, it was after the meeting that the parties themselves said, okay, we are also hearing this for the first time. But subsequent to that, they've all reacted to it. Mm -hmm. Finally, the thing has been redrawn. You know. So what we do as Peace Council is provide the forum for these parties and interested groups to talk. And once they, we give them the, 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 the opportunity to do that, we're able to resolve issues. You know. Have you had any conversation about the use of the Ghana card as the sole identification going into election? No, we've not, we've not talked about it. Parliament has been dealing with this issue. Mm -hmm. And if we have the People's Forum talking, we just keep quiet and watch them and uh, let them see how they resolve it. And we've, as we said, we want to rather contribute to the conversation in Parliament as National Peace Council? We have meetings with some of these leaders and we can talk about all kinds of things. But whilst they are doing the, the negotiation or discussion in Parliament, we want to sit back and see how it ends up. You know, if you take the case of... Why do you want to sit back when your position is extremely critical in formulating the laws of this country? You rather want to wait for the laws no. to be passed before you make your position known? What is happening is that a lot of people are expecting the council to do something beyond its mandate. And that issue came up in our last meeting. Mm. And we even put it out. But the, that but, currently, the Ghanaian public is expecting so much from the Peace Council, which is totally outside our mandate. Well, pre because of the precedence, it is, the expectations from the Peace Council or of the Peace Council is not born in oblivion. It is because of what has been the case mm. previously mm. until you became chair. So right. you can't blame the Ghanaian people. Right. So for us now, for, you have... Top lawyers like Nana Dr. S. K. B. Asante or with us. Mm -hmm. And he will constantly draw attention to the fact that, look, be careful, you don't have a mandate to do this. You don't have a mandate. Now we have been assigned a lawyer who is on full time at, at our secretariat. Right. So people are now drawing attention. Let's be careful. We don't we are living in a society where people can easily sue you. So we are conscious of what our mandate is. We've made recommendations that we think that this act must be looked at again. The act that governs the, your yeah, work. That's right. Your mandate. Mandate must be looked at because the expectation of the people, what they think that we should be doing, is totally different from what this act mandates us to do. Mm -hmm. And we think that if this is the expectation, then there's a need for us to come back and look at this act and determine how do we go around this. But c can you, based on your own engagements, as you indicated, you've done engagements in the, some regions in the north and other parts of the country ahead of election 2024, you've picked up s some concerns of the people. Obviously, the, the not having Ghana card will be one of the issues that you may have picked up. Based on that information that you pick up with your own activities, can you not put together a document and say, Parliament, this is what we have picked? And this is the National Peace Council's observation. So take into consideration your deliberations on issues like whether or not the Ghana card should be used as a sole document for elections. As I said, we have engagement with different uh, entities. And once we meet with them, the concerns that we have are passed on to them. Mm. Right. So once we do that, we've come to the end of, of, of ours. And mm. we expect that they themselves will take it up and, and move on. Right. Mm. So it's not that the council is totally redrawn and not doing anything. We have several engagements, several engagements. And uh, in all of these things, we, we do the best we can. In, in the past, I've been in, involved in some of the peace dialogues that you, you have organized over the mm. period, right from, from 2008 um, to this point. Mm. You have the political parties committing to peace or not engage in violence, or not even use or engage in vigilante groups. Mm -hmm. But then on election day, something different happens. So what are you going to do differently to get the political parties to commit honestly to these agreements that you reach during these peace dialogues that you organize? Right. It's 
Part of the reason why our engagement with the parties is not waiting till the last peace pact. In fact, for us this year, these peace pacts will done, be done in some of the constituencies, or if possible, all the constituencies before we come to the national one. So we're looking at things from a different perspective uh, now. Now, the other thing is that in our engagement with the political parties, we are gradually coming to a point where the issues that are becoming hotspots are gradually showing up. Mm -hmm. For instance, in our dialogue last week, when we raised the issue of interpreted language and the hate speech guide, uh, guide, all of them said, Chairman, this is where the issue is. If we can look at this issue and deal with it, mm -hmm. then we'd have solved the problems that we have. Because most of the things that do happen comes from the rhetorics of the, these political uh, parties and, and actors. Some of the things they say, how they say, that instigates people and all of that. So we looked at it and we said, fine. Now you're asking us to set up a committee. The committee will be set up, we'll come back. How does this committee, which is set up by you, mm -hmm. help us to monitor this space so that we don't get into some of those, those, uh, those, those things? So a lot is being done, and we're hoping that there will be positive results uh, coming out of these things. We are not resting because we know uh, what is involved in this election. Mm -hmm. And all of us are concerned. The stakes are very high. The stakes are very high. And all of us are concerned. And we want to do the best we can to ensure that not a single life is lost. By the end of the day, elections can be held peacefully. People can go and vote. Declaration of results are done. It's accepted. And we move on as a country and live. Because it's only in peace that businesses can run. It's only in peace that the market women can go back to the market. It's only in peace that schools can run. If you look at what is happening in Boko now, mm -hmm. where almost everything is at a standstill, nobody wants to think that this thing should be allowed to extend to the rest of the country. But if we don't take care, we could get into a critical situation. Well, so how did the political parties commit to have their members abide by the agreement not to use intemperate language that could degenerate into something uncontrollable? We, we have put a document out. They've looked at it. They think uh, it's, it's something workable. Mm -hmm. They've asked that we set up this committee to move the processes forward. And the committee members will certainly come from amongst themselves. So if they have a committee that is monitoring these things, then we expect that it should work for us. See, now, the issue of political vigilantism, did the political parties commit? Well, there's a law that bans the engagement of uh, vigilante groups mm -hmm in this country but the political parties say because of the lack of trust for the the state's security apparatus they would rather also have their own form of security how did that get resolved during that uh, engagement that you had with the political parties in our engagement in the, uh, the last but one engagement we had in uh, for what in the world, Pediasi, mm -hmm. just before Christmas, the NPP made a public statement that as far as they are concerned, all their groups have been disbanded. That's what the NPP said? That's what they said. Did you hold them to strict proof? We have told them that once they've said that, we are going to hold them to the statement they've made. Uh, we did not get a direct statement from the NDC yet, uh, but we are also monitoring but we know the law is in place. Uh, we are going to carry out a lot of our education on that law. In the last election, we did it in all the 275 constituencies. We're going to do the same this year, you know. And I recall I was in Adan when we had that dialogue with the political parties. Mm -hmm. As soon as they saw the content of the law, both CPP, uh, CPP, NDC, MPP delegates were there said, look, chairman, leave this with us. If this is it, then we will go to the community and educate them. So we think that people need education. Once they get to know what is in the law and its implications on their lives, then we, they are careful. Because when you flood that law, you can go to prison for 15 years. Mm -hmm. Why do I want to fo follow somebody and go and misbehave and go to prison for 15 years while the person is uh, out there enjoying himself? Mm -hmm. So people need to be educated on these things. And we, we will do the best we can. Even though the NDC has agreed to return to IPAC, it's, it's predicated on a certain condition that is the conduct of the electoral commission mm -hmm. for you as the peace council during your engagement what was the the proposition to the to the electoral commission in terms of having 
a posture, a conduct that would ensure some level of understanding and, 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 and compromise and then also you would have some agreement during their deliberations as, 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 a, as right. a commission. We, we had several engagements with the EC initially about um, uh, working with the NDC to come to back to IPAC. Mm. Uh, it's, been, it's been a long negotiation uh, to come to this, this stage. Mm. Uh, different meetings between the old administration, Freddie Blay and uh, uh, Fuso and Pofu and all the way coming up to where we are now. Right. Now, when we met at uh, Pediasi, when the NDC made their statement, they pointed out clearly there the issues that they think has prevented them from come, moving out of IPAC. And at that meeting, the EC said, this is the first time we are hearing this. That's what the election that's, commission, that's commission said. said. That is the first time they're they are hearing. hearing what NDC said at that meeting. Because earlier on, they thought that, that their, their redrawal was based on something else. But this was the first time they were in that. They emphasized the need for consensus building and all of those things. Right. So they had it that we want to go back where well, we are going back because we expect that there will be consensus, there will be uh, agreement on some of these things. I am happy but sitting the back. have been very clear, um, in, at least in public engagements, media engagements, the reason why they are not part uh, of IPAC or they see, withdrew from IPAC. Well, sometimes it's something is said in the public space, but it may not be what is said in the inner space. So that's why I'm saying that for us, who were there. We had heard NDC say some of these, but for EC, they said this is the first time we are hearing this directly from NDC. Okay. Right. Now, after that, when NDC returned to IPAC, we heard this indelible ink and all the things that they've done. Over there, the issues have been resolved. So we think that our position is to create the space for people to talk. So we create that space, brought all of them together, and when Jane spoke at that place and affirmed, because I, at that point, I threw directly to NDC that we are here and we are expecting you to make a direct commitment today. And uh, Senator Ketua said that, look, you've cornered us, you brought us, we've done other things. They thought that we could have done other things before this week, but you brought us into space to com commit us. But finally, after he made all the comments and his reasons and all of those things, he committed that, okay, we are ready to go because you made an appeal. But Jim Ensign also made an appeal to NDC at that meeting. Come back, we are extending our only brand to you. And after he had spoken, went and greeted all of them, which to us was the first time we're seeing that in several years, mm -hmm. after the last election. So we create a space, bring the people together, let them talk, we facilitate it. And then at the end of the day, if there's a resolution, we sit back and we thank God for what we've been able to do. So we'll continue with all of these things and we are monitoring right now, since that meeting, we have a rep who sits in IPAC. So a member of the Peace Council is there, yeah. sitting there, observing all the things going on. So that we also have... As to whether that, that... All the, the things we're talking consensus about, the consensus... Has been sustained that's right, and been right. carried that's throughout right. the period. So that's what we are doing now. We are monitoring all of these things. So we've not sat back as it, as it were, created a space, they came and made a commitment, and after that you've gone to sleep. Now we send our rep there, who is also a lawyer, to sit down and listen to all the things they are doing. So we are getting first hand information from the, the, the discussions going on at the IPAC. Reverend Dr. Enes Adujanfi is chair of the National Peace Council. This is Hot Issues. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is Hot Issues on TV3. My guest, Reverend Dr. Enes Adujanfi, is the chair of the National Peace Council, outlining the mandate of the council. And, and what they also intend to do going forward ahead of election 2024. And you're very clear in your mind this, the, the, the stakes, how high the stakes are ahead of election 2024. And then also the campaigning has already started. Hmm. Now, before we get to the point where there is there's an issue for the Peace Council to step in, do you have any plan to also guide the campaigning of the political parties, which is, which is essential as well, going forward. Yes. Um, in the first place, the, uh, the guide on interpreted language, which was discussed at the last meeting, we believe forms the foundation of, of our negotiation with them to be guided by what they say and how they say these things. Mm -hmm. 
so we're looking at how that will help us in terms of guiding what guiding them in what they say on the on the political platforms. So we are looking at all those things. Then we are we have also outlined a lot of training programs across the country. Mm -hmm. Currently, we are empowering all the regional councils to be actively involved in uh, several activities okay. that will help us in terms of uh, all of these things. But we are not doing them in isolation. Um, currently, there are about 457 chieftaincy and land litigation cases across the country. 467? 457. 57. Land litigation. Land and chieftaincy. And chieftaincy. You know. And all of these things... We've seen some of them have claimed lives. Yes. Recently. Well, we've seen them quanta issues and all mm -hmm. of those things. We are dealing with all of, the, all of these. Yesterday, somebody from the Fulani community wanted to engage me, so we shared a meeting for next week. You know, so there are all kinds of things happening across the country. Now, sometimes the challenge we have is that the public seem to be drawing us only into politics leaving out all these other things that are creating a lot of problems. And so we keep telling the politician, let's be mindful of the fact that there are several issues that the council is handling. Mm. So if you push us only into politics, we are leaving the others, and then the politics feeds into these other things. That so, creates more, more problems. Now that's what the point I was going about making, that a lot of the chieftaincy conflict we're seeing have political... That's, that's right. Terms. Now that's what, what is happening. And, I mean, at the last forum, we had some of the, the party people, they told us that, look, Chairman, right now, politics has entered everything in this country. And so, that is why we are caught up in this whole web. So, if you are dealing with a land issue, but then you realize that behind the land issue, there are some politicians who are there, you get into chieftaincy, they are there, all kinds of issues are crisscrossing us. So, we have this, so we're doing a lot of advocacy against the threat to violent extremism, which we're going to carry out in all the 275 constituencies. We are doing some training on uh, uh, peace reporting for media personnel. Mm -hmm. We want to do that. We know that uh, NMC, uh, GA did something last week. Right. We're going to follow up on all of these things to ensure that uh, in terms of our reportage, we cover things from, because sometimes some of the issues are minor. If you mm -hmm. take even our own dialogue last week, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Hannah Bissou made some comments. During the when she entered the meeting, I mean, she had just barely sat down for five minutes when she made those comments, but she had never at, 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 uh, attended any of our meetings. But after she made the comment, we clarified the position. Everything went very well in terms of the meeting. They came to some conclusions. All of us agreed that let's support the peace council and get their work done. Unfortunately, one media house picked just what she said, threw it out into the public domain, and suddenly everybody was crying. You know. So sometimes reportage alone creates problems for us. And we think that the media houses need to come to some understanding of this work and what we need to do. So now we are not only looking at reporters, but we're looking at media house owners and editors to be sure that we bring them to the table for them to understand some of these things. Then we're also looking at the national dialogue to address chieftaincy issues. We've had discussion with the president. He had wanted us to do this last year. It didn't come on. We are still working on it to have this national dialogue on these chieftaincy matters because it's spreading across all the places. Now you see some chiefs who are declaring for certain candidates and mm -hmm. this shouldn't have been the case. But now we are seeing these things happen. And once a chief does Probably that, because the National Peace Council was silent and was watching on? No, we, ha we haven't been. And we know that the laws are there. You are not supposed to do this. So when people start doing them, then we come in and we call them to order and say, look, this is not the way to go. Because if you do that, you affect the community. Not only chiefs, the same happens even to pastors and imams. If you stand in the church to make a declaration for this party, you mean you have divided your church. Because you have people there representing various uh, parties. So these are things that we want to carry on, educate the public, let them know these things, so that uh, they all understand that within the space, there's a need for us to uh, conduct ourselves properly and not create problems for our country. When you sit back as chair of the National Peace Council, you listen to, especially young people, there's a sense of, of hopelessness. You see people leaving this country in droves mm. and that level of despondency. How do you feel? It's quite disheartening to see that uh, in my former office, we have the Canadian Visa Center there. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And so I sit in the office and look into the, the window and see all the people who are down there. Right now, they fill the whole street. Sometimes cars can even pass there. Mm -hmm. It's disheartening to see these things. That's around the Ajoa Abelempe. Abelempe area, mm -hmm. you know. But this is something that requires the effort of all of us. All of us. How? Right. Businessmen have difficulty now expanding mm -hmm. because you employ somebody and you think that you are providing jobs for the person. Then people come into the job, they start stealing, they start doing all manner of things. I have a friend in the US who was running his own business. He decided to retire. He handed over the business to somebody, another guy in. And yet the business is being run professionally there that he can sit at home and get somebody to run his business for him. In this country, we have a challenge. So businesses are not expanding. And sometimes when we look at, the government has this responsibility to create the opportunity, conditions of opportunity for businesses to expand. Has that been done? Well, they say, I'm not for them. But, but you, you live the realities of every day. Right. So you speak to the realities. Right. Has so that been done? We see some of them, but the issue is that this is to create the avenue. Businessmen are supposed to step into that space and create the opportunity. But if you find that people are not responding the way they ought to respond to businesses, it becomes difficult for people to expand. So that becomes a problem. So one, we need to do public education of our own people that look, take any business as something that gives you your daily bread. And so you don't get into that space and think that because somebody has said business, he has money. And so let me do whatever I want to do. That is important. And I think that some of these things, we need to go back to our busy schools and start teaching some of the things we learned in the 60s. You know. So we need those things. The commitment to work and seeking to do hard work. A lot of young people right now want the good life, and yet they are not ready to work. So that is very important. So once we begin to commit to serious work, it opens the door for others to also seek to do what, what they need to do. So there's a need for the government's side to create a continual environment, provide the opportunity for people, provide the exp needed expansion, and then for businesses also to take advantage of these opportunities. Then there's also the need for me now, I think that we need some national consensus in looking at the economy and not look at only one party. We had the, uh, what we call the- National Development Planning that's right, Commission. Commission, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you talk to some of them, some of them will tell you that, look, Kosibokwe's team did a very good work, but we've left it there. What prevents us from going back to take that document, look at what we've done now, merge them together, and see what can we do. Set the agenda. This is where we want to go in the next 30 years. Once this party comes into power, you follow that agenda and tell us what you can do out of that. Right now, it's like... Four years, I've done whatever I want to do. Another person comes, another four years, that's whatever he wants to do. Somebody else comes, he does whatever he wants to do. So there is a consistency in this country. Mm -hmm. And that, is, that makes it difficult even for business people to expand. So those are issues that we need to address. And sometimes I also want to appeal to the media houses. We seem to be directing the way the country must go mm -hmm. in our, our, our discourse every morning. Let us factor these things into our conversation it will be helpful to all of us that people will begin to see what can we do to bring uh, employment to our people? What can we do to help them to do some of the things they ought to do? There are some young people who could do other things that could also give them some money. But sometimes they are just sitting at home because I'm only looking for an office work. Is there anything else that I can do? I've seen a young man in my area mm -hmm. who just got a pickup and decided to buy a few uh, mowing machines and put them moving from house to house, doing the loans for other people. He makes money, and it's fine now, you know. But you tell someone, well, how can I go to invest here? But then they will go abroad and do the same work. Mm -hmm. So why can't we do it here? You know, I've seen somebody who was a big accountant somewhere, he just resigned and set up a laundromat, where people just come and wash their things. And someone will ask, how can an accountant do this? But he's surviving, and he's making it. Okay. So there are opportunities that I think we need to be looking at and we need to educate the public what are the spaces that people can step into and be able to make a living out of this. If we constantly teach and talk about these things, it will be helpful to our country. Reverend Dr. Enes Edujemfi, he is the chair of the National Peace Council, former chair of the Christian Council of Ghana 
and then also former president of the Ghana Baptist Convention. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much for having us. Well, that's it for Hot Issues. My name is Alfred Okanse. I sat in for your regular host, Kemini Amano. She joins us next week. Do have a great Sunday.